All right, folks, welcome back. Man, life has been kicking me right in the plums lately. Just nonstop. Work has sucked. Life has sucked. Everything's kind of sucked. I haven't been on the range in a couple weeks, which means I haven't put out any videos in a couple weeks. And the timing could not be worse. Because my last video where we popped out that round with the grease gun, that is already my most viewed video ever. So lots of views, lots of new subscribers, and absolutely no new content to post on the channel. It's just been kind of crappy. So today is a mental health rehabilitation sort of day. And I want to go back to an old friend and shoot some 300 blackout. I haven't done a 300 blackout video in a year and a half. Back in the early days of my channel, this was a, a huge focus. We used to shoot a, an eight and a half inch barrel and a 16 inch barrel. And we really kind of explored the world of 300 blackout. My current upper is a 10.3 inch ballistic advantage premium series BA Hansen profile one in seven twist barrel. Man, ballistic advantage has got the longest barrel names ever. They need to shorten that stuff up a little bit, but we haven't shot much 300 blackout because well, I was short on uppers. I didn't have enough upper receivers and some barrels kind of got pulled out to make room for others and 300 blackout just kind of got put to the side for a while because we had already shot it so much. But today it's time to come back and I want to shoot a pretty cool bullet. It is the Nosler Ballistic Tip Subsonic. It is a 220 grain expanding subsonic bullet. This is the same bullet they use in that goofy uh, Noveski glow in the dark freaking ammo. I don't know if you've seen those or not, but there's some Noveski branded crap where the, the tip glows in the dark and uh, it's just ridiculous. But these are the same bullet. They have a more reasonable, more conservative green tip. And I want to see if these guys will shoot. I've been sitting on these for a, at least a year. I mean, I think I got them. They came out, they hit the market right after I had made my last 300 blackout video and I just never got around to making a video on them. So that's the basics for today. Let's see how these guys shoot. Let's see if it, we can work up a subsonic load. And I've even, I've got some like super janky looking ballistic gel. It really needs melted down, but I think maybe for some sub, uh, for some subsonics, we can go ahead and shoot some of these into it and it'll do good enough just to see how they, how they expand. The powder for today is going to be Hodgton CFE Black, or I think Hodgton calls it CFE BLK, which is hard to say. CFE Black just rolls off the tongue a whole lot easier. So that's what we call it around here, Hodgton CFE Black. Obviously, this is a purpose-built 300 blackout powder. It's a lot like Accurate 1680 in that it does a good job on uh, 300 blackout subsonics, produces lots of gas, so it generally runs in action pretty well. And we had pretty good luck with it when it first came out. We shot through a couple pounds of it in previous videos and it did just fine. For brass, we're going to change things up a little bit. I've actually got some brand new Hornady 300 Blackout Brass. A a uh, viewer had sent me this a million years ago. If I remember correctly, a Gander Mountain store was closing out their reloading section and he got this and some 6.5 Grendel brass, pretty cheap and bought them all for me and sent them to me. So here they are. Hopefully that's 50 pieces. Most of our previous testing is done with converted Lake City 556 brass. But today we're going to take the easy route and use some Hornady. Remember, this is a mental health rehabilitation video. We want things as easy as possible and pre-made Hornady blackout brass is going to make things pretty easy. The primers are going to be CCI number 41 primers, and that's pretty much it. Now, the thing is, Nosler doesn't have any load data on their website for this bullet, so we're kind of working from scratch here, and to be honest, when you're working up uh, subsonics, it's going to depend a lot on your barrel length, right? Back in our earlier videos where we used to shoot the 8.5 inch barrel and the 16 inch barrel and compare the different charge weights for subsonic rounds between those two, like we learned, like it's very dependent on barrel length, especially especially with the slower burning powders like CFE Black, Accurate 1680, or Reloader 7. Some of those slower uh, powders are a little bit more dependent on barrel length than some of the faster options like Winchester 296, H110, Gun, that sort of thing. There's a little bit less difference. But today we're shooting CFE Black, so we're starting from scratch here. We know nothing. So traditionally what we do is we load up a few rounds at varying charge weights and just go out and get some velocities. And for those first tests, we generally shoot without the suppressor so we can make sure they're going to stabilize properly. We don't want to get a baffle strike in our suppressor. So it's good to see them flying straight without the suppressor before we screw that guy on. And that's the plan we're going to go with today. So I looked on the Hodgson website for some of their low data for bullets in this weight range. And here's what I want to shoot. I want to shoot 10.5, 11, 11.5, 12, and 12.5. Cover a big, huge range. 
range. We'll go out and shoot those, we'll make sure they stabilize, we'll come back inside and we'll put those on a chart and try and narrow down on the exact charge weight that's gonna get us in the 1,050 feet per second range. Cause that's the target. In my area, at my elevation, at the temperatures I'm generally shooting in, the subsonic to supersonic threshold is generally a little bit over 1,100 feet per second. So for me, a, a target of 1,050 feet per second is just about perfect. Gives a little bit of room so that all of the rounds are definitely under that sound barrier, but high enough to where we feel like we're taking advantage of all of the velocity we can. If you're at high elevation in Colorado, or if you're at sea level, down by the ocean somewhere, your numbers are gonna change a little bit. Same deal with temperature. So that's the plan. What we've gotta do now is figure out an overall length to go with. You saw the picture. These are very blunt bullets, you know, as far as the ogive goes. So I have a feeling we're gonna need a pretty short overall length to fit them in the chamber without jamming into the lands. So let's have a look at that next. All right, so there are a lot of ways to skin this particular cat. You can use a Hornady overall length gauge like this to determine your maximum overall length. You get a modified case that screws into here. This loosens up so it can slide and then you drop a bullet in the front and then this is able to push the bullet forward and stuff with your modified case up in the chamber. But over time I've found my favorite way of determining maximum overall length is to take a resized piece of brass that fits into your chamber and then cut a big slit down the neck with a Dremel tool. So what we've got now is a case that fits in the chamber that a bullet can slide up and down in with with a good bit of resistance. And as it loosens up, you just pinch it a little bit closed to get a little bit tighter. So let's put this guy in here. Let's get an initial overall length measurement. It should be extremely long. There we go, 2.319. So we've definitely got it long enough. Then I just put it into the ejection port, get it under the extractor and then tilt it until it's straight and then push your bolt carrier forward. And then that allows the rifling to actually go ahead and seat that bullet into the case. Then you pop your bolt carrier back, and then as soon as you can, you get your finger down in there to keep that round straight, and then out it comes. And now we've got a round where the rifling seated our bullet, and it should be at basically our maximum overall length, 2.097. So let me write that down. And then another step I like to take is to use the Hornady bullet comparator tool. Let's get this guy turned on and let's take a cartridge-based ogive measurement. There we go, bullet up into that guy. And our cartridge-based ogive measurement is 1.705. So that rep represents the longest possible cartridge we should load. And I've done this exercise four different times and I've come out with cartridge based ogive numbers between 1.703 and 1.706 and overall length numbers. And I've used a different bullet every time because these seem to have reasonably uniform tips, but a lot of bullets won't. And your actual, actual overall length number will vary a little bit depending on the bullet tips. But here with these guys, I've got numbers from 2.9, 094 up to 2.098. So that gives us a good idea of what our maximum cartridge length is. Now we want to be shorter than that. We don't want to be right up onto the lands of the rifling, at least not to start off with. So let's go with a number that will give us an overall length of about uh, 2.075. That's about 20 thousandths of jump from the ogive to the lands of the rifling. Give us a little bit of a uh, little bit of wiggle room there. So that should be an overall length of about 2.075 and a cartridge based ogive number of 1.685. I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and take our, our dummy round here and shorten it down just a little bit to, oop, that's pretty close right there. 1.685 is our target. Yeah, it's usually not that easy but <laughs> should be about a 2.075 inch overall length. Pretty darn close. That's going to vary just a touch. So that's what our completed rounds are gonna look like. So those will fit nicely in our chamber. We're not hit, uh, hitting the lands. And let's have a look at how far down into the, the case our bullet is protruding. We're gonna have plenty of room there for our you know 10 to 12 uh, grain charge of CFE black. So that's it, that's the plan. And now all we need to do is prep our new Hornady brass and get it ready to load. All right, so the sizing die for today is going to be a standard Forster full length sizing die. I actually did a series of videos like a sizing die shootout between the Forster and a Lee and an RCBS in the past. I found that all of them work just fine in my guns, but some guns are kind of picky. The RCBS and the Forster both did a pretty good job. The Lee, some people have some issues with if they have a particularly tight chamber. 
So the whole purpose here with this resizing is just to make sure that the, the necks are perfectly round. So don't expect to be, you know, bumping the shoulder or sizing the body at all. It's really just about making sure that the necks are uniform. They're all at the same diameter. So we have consistent neck tension and ironing out any, you know, dings and dents that might've happened in their factory packaging. I fully three size all new brass, no matter the manufacturer. Some of them claim that their stuff is ready to load straight out of the box, but I like to go ahead and run them through a resize. Now, new brass, generally, like I mentioned, we're not touching the body, we're not touching the shoulder. It's a very easy uh, resizing process. And for that reason, I don't wanna go through the process of lubing the heck out of these guys. So all I'm gonna use is a little bit of this, Redding Imperial Dry Neck Lube. It's just kind of a graphite sort of lube that you dunk the case down in. It gives you a light coating of graphite around that neck. And I think we should be okay. We, we should be okay. But then again, we might be about to stick a case. I don't know, we'll find out. Yeah, that went up in there super easy. Came out super easy. We grab ourselves a rag, wipe off that little bit of neck lube, and this guy's sized and ready to go. I didn't do a very good job of wiping off that neck lube, did I? There we go. That's a little bit better. So that's it. That's all I'm going to do to these 50 pieces of brass. What I generally do after I've done a couple cases and I feel like I've got some of that dry neck lube up into the die, I'll go a couple pieces between applications of the dry neck lube. Like these don't feel tight at all or they don't feel like they're about to stick. So no need to go overboard on the lube. So I'll finish up these 50 pieces and then we'll be ready to go ahead and finish up our brass prep and we'll be on the range here in no time. So a couple things I forgot to mention at the beginning of the video was the price on these Nosler ballistic tip subsonic bullets. They're available at Midway and they're about 50 cents a piece. So they come in boxes of 50, yep, 50 count, and they're in the $25 neighborhood. Pretty much all of the expanding subsonic 300 blackout bullets are expensive, but these are a little bit cheaper than most of the, of the copper solids, but still a little bit pricey. The other thing, look at this brand new bench mat we got. In my last video, I dumped a bunch of motor oil on my previous mat and mentioned that, yep, I was probably gonna need to get a new one. And a viewer named Jory, got in touch with me, said he wanted to buy me a new bench mat. So that's what this is. Thank you very much to Jory for sending me a fresh mat. These bench mats are available at Midway and I really, really like them. They're just the right thickness. They've got a little bit of texture to them, but it's not so bad that powder and junk gets stuck in them. You know, they're reasonably easy to clean and they make for a nice work surface that's a little bit soft, absorbs vibrations and stuff, makes a nice platform for your, for your scale and stuff like that. So thanks to Jory for uh, replacing my last one. The old one will go into service now as an actual cleaning mat, which is, you know, what these are really for. I think the biggest one, like this one's freaking gigantic. And I think it's about 25 bucks and they go down in price from there if you need a smaller one. So that's about it. So we've got brass that has now been resized. And the next step I want to do is just make sure these case mouths are in good shape. Kind of deburr them a touch with a deburring tool. A little bit on the inside, a little bit on the outside, nothing crazy. But enough to make sure we don't have any burrs and that our bullet is going to slide down in there nicely. All right, so the next step is to install our primers. I am doing so with a Frankfurt Arsenal hand priming tool. All right, so I'm weighing out our first 10 charge weights. I'm gonna do two rounds with each charge weight. So 10.5 all the way up to 12.5, two of each and we'll just see what sort of velocities we see. Hopefully I picked the right range. Generally this, I don't know, 11 to 12 range is pretty good for like accurate 1680 and CFE black usually gets you about where you need to be. So we'll see how it goes. Next up, we need to pick a bullet seating die and talk over a little bit about seating stems. All right, so our first 10 bullets are ready to seat, but we need to pick a bullet seating die. We've got a couple options here. I've got a Hornady, a Forster, and a Lee. Let's start out with the Lee. This is the seating stem from the Lee. That's what makes contact with our bullet. And if we grab one of our bullets and put it in there, 
you can see how wiggly it is. There is very little of the seating stem making contact with the O-drive of the bullet, which means that the seating pressure that's applied to the bullet is going to be focused around a ring, probably just below the tip. So this is an extremely poor fit. And I don't have any other options as far as seating stems go for my Lee die. So this is definitely not what we're going to use. If we move over to the Forster die, this is its seating stem. And if we put it down in there, you'll see that it makes a pretty nice fit. I mean, actually a really excellent fit. So the Forster would be a good option. The bad thing about the Forster dies is the way their seating stems are made, it is so thin around the edge that a couple of these, I'm not sure if I've cracked this one yet or not, but these seating stems, I've had several of them crack on me just because they're so darn thin. So good fit. This would be a good option here for this nozzler bullet. If we move over to the Hornady die, this is the seating stem that comes with that 30 caliber seating die. And I think this one is even worse than the Lee was. Like the bullet barely goes in there at all and makes very little contact. So that's terrible. I've also got a seating stem for the Hornady die that's meant for 178, 200, and 220 grain Hornady ELDX bullets. So if we try this guy out, that is a much better fit. That feels a whole lot like our Forster. Yep, just about as good as the Forster. Maybe not quite as good. So if you look at the difference between these two stems, you can see they're quite different. So what I want to do is I want to use the Hornady die with this stem, with the ELDX stem. Gives us a pretty decent fit. So let's get this guy installed and we'll move over to the press. So I haven't actually used this die with 300 blackout before, so let's hope it works okay. These Hornady dies are universal by caliber. They just have a, they have a little sliding part here that the neck of the case, which let me grab a, let me grab a case here. This fits nice and tight down inside of there. Well, kind of nice and tight. That's a little bit sloppy, but that's what helps guide the bullet into the case and they're universal by caliber. So this should work for any 30 caliber case, hopefully, assuming we can get it low enough here for 300 blackout. So we screw it down until we feel it touch the case mouth. Uh oh, we're running out of adjustment. Oh, there it went. Okay. So there we have fill the bottom out. It's touching the case and then we back it out at least one full turn. And in this case, it's actually going to be like a turn and three quarters. So I can see my adjustments there, which you can't see on camera. There we go. We'll back the camera up. There we go. So that's where you uh, read the adjustments here on this Hornady micro just seating stem adjuster thing. So we tighten it all down. We back our seating stem out a good bit to make sure we're not starting too short. And then let's get started. So here's our first one going up inside of there. Let's see, it's already touching. That seated halfway decent. Didn't feel too much weird resistance or anything like that. First one out of the die, I'm looking to make sure I'm not digging up copper jacket material or anything. Everything seemed to go together pretty decent. Now, we know that our target overall length is 2.075 or 1.685 with the Hornady bullet comparator. So we're over 200 thousandths long right now. So let's go we're actually 260 thousandths. Let's go down 250 thousandths. 50, 100, 150, 200, 250. Hopefully I didn't screw up my count there and seat it on down. That's looking a whole lot better. Pretty close to where we need to be. All right, that one reads 1.704. Now, one thing I am noticing here on the O drive of the bullet, I am getting a little bit of a mark where the seating stem contacts the bullet. It's not bad. Like I don't think our bullet is getting deformed in any way. It still looks okay, but not quite a perfect seating stem fit. So let's go ahead and seat a second one here and we'll compare the measurements. Yep, that one seated pretty smooth. Like when it's first coming through the neck, there's definitely some resistance there. 
I think this one's a bit shorter. 1.700. What was our target? 1.685. Let's go down 15 thousandths. 10, 15. And we'll seat this guy one more time. And we'll seat that first one again and see what sort of numbers we come up with. So this is the first one. It's currently at 1.688. And the second one is at 1.687. So I've gone down about two more thousandths. Let's seat them one last time and that should be good. Okay, so we've got a 1.685, which is our target. And the other one I think is just a smidgen shorter than that at 1.6845. Okay, good. That's looking like a pretty good setting. What I'm gonna do, I think these might be a little bit compressed or it's definitely a full case. I wanna jump up to our max charge of 12.5 grains and see if our overall length is getting longer. If it's heavily compressed, yeah, I think that is. Like the top of that stroke really felt some resistance. And yeah, we are boogering up the bullet just a touch. Have a look at that ring. Now we've started to actually make a mark that might be just a little bit of a problem. I'm gonna assume the overall length on this grew quite a bit. Yeah, it grew a bunch. 1.711, 26 thousandths. So I think these are quite a bit compressed. All right, let me go back. This is our second load, which is 11.0 grains. That time I didn't feel that heavy resistance at the top of the stroke. I might've gone a little bit too high, like 12.5 grains might've been a bit too high to go. But that's okay, like even if our velocities are way over our supersonic threshold, that's still all right. First one here in the second row is 1.690, so that's five thousandths long. And the next one is exactly the same, 1.690. So let's go down, actually we probably need to go a little bit more than five. So there's about seven. See if that puts us about where we need to be. Maybe for the, for the next batch, like once we get this first batch out to the range and get some initial velocity readings, maybe we'll try that Forster die on the next batch. There we go, that's just about right, 1.6845. And the other one is just about the same, 1.6845. So that's probably what I'm gonna to have to do here is every incremental row is gonna be a little bit long due to the increased compression of the load. Yep, there's this dude at 1.6845. 690 so I'm gonna to have to go down like seven thousandths or so with each row so hopefully that makes sense that was still a touch long 1.686 try the next one here 1.6855 so these are about a thousandth of an inch longer than the last row that's fine I tell you what I'm gonna go ahead and just go down before I even start on the next row yeah, hopefully we didn't get our charge weights too high. It shouldn't be a safety concern. Like with these subsonics, we're not talking about high pressure or pressure problems generally. Yeah, this guy's still long, 1.692. So even if say our first rounds here are 1200 feet per second or something, we're probably not going to blow our face off, hopefully. All right, so I finally got the fourth row. I had to make three or four adjustments to make sure it was down to 1.685. And these are really getting smushed. Yeah, really kind of getting smushed. The other one's the same. So 12, 12 and a half. We definitely got a little bit of bullet deformation. So that's it, folks. I'm just going to finish up these last two here. And we'll be ready to go ahead and hit the range. Let's get out there. Okay, folks, this is our gun. Like I mentioned earlier, this is a 10.3 inch. Ballistic Advantage Premium Series Barrel with a one in seven twist. Now, since we're shooting the short barreled upper today, I do have my SBR lower here so I don't go to prison. It has got a Magpul UBR stock. The UBR is not too bad. We got a little bit of a flat spot back here that's gonna ride our rear bag halfway decent. Not quite as good as the Magpul PRS that I normally shoot, but hopefully it'll be good enough to hold some groups. On top, I have this comically gigantic Vortex Strike Eagle 4 to 24 by 50 scope. I understand that it, it looks absolutely ridiculous, but for, you know, group testing like this, I want all the magnification I can get. I don't even remember what it was about, but I had a video planned a long time ago with a bunch of factory ammo. So like I've got six different kinds of 220 grain subsonic factory ammo. 
So I used a little bit of this to get the gun sighted in here just a few minutes ago. And I got our adjustable gas block set properly. I should probably put, stop putting my finger in front of the muzzle. The bolt is locked back, so you know, I'm confident the gun isn't gonna blow my face off or blow my hand off in this case, but it's kind of stupid to keep doing that. I've done it a couple times now. All right, where was I? Yeah, so I, I sighted in the gun with factory ammo, 220 grain bullets, and everything was fine. Gas block is set just about perfect with the suppressor. Now, these first 10 rounds without the suppressor, we may not function properly, and that's totally okay. Once we put the suppressor on, then we'll start worrying about that. Now, I've got a target at 100 yards. Normally, on these stability tests like this, I do them at like 25 yards, but from my earlier shooting, getting the gun sighted in, I've already got my target set up down there and I'm too lazy to bring it back in and set it up short. So we're just gonna do the stability test here at 100 yards. Now, you'll notice I do have a gigantic blaze orange lab radar chronograph set up here. So hopefully you guys, if the glare isn't too bad, the glare's kind of bad today, isn't it? Hopefully the glare is not too bad and you guys will be able to watch the velocities as they come in. So our first charge weight is 10.5 grains. We're gonna start low and work up. I should probably start high and work my way down. You know what? Yeah, let's do that. Change of plans. Our first charge weight is 12.5 grains. These were the ones very compressed, a little bit of bullet deformation going on. Let's make sure they're gonna feed. Yep, those fed just fine. Let's have a look at them to make sure the bullets didn't get scarred up or set back into the case or anything. Nope, they are flawless. So hopefully we don't have any feeding problems. And hopefully my gun stops falling over. All right, here we go. 12.5 grains. We're looking for velocity and we're looking for nice round bullet holes down there. We're not shooting for accuracy here, so I don't really care where the hell they land. It's all about velocity and flight. So let's see how these guys do. Okay, that is not a good start. That guy hit quite a bit low and the, the hole looks sideways let's shoot the next one velocity was 1221 so we're yeah a good bit high well it landed right next to that other one but yeah we're still at about 1200 feet per second so let's move on to the next one 12.0 grains it looks like we didn't quite feed that next one properly Yep, the bolt rode over top of it. Let's try it again. Yeah, that might have been so low that it's off camera. Basically every hole so far has been sideways. Here's 11.5. I'll try and aim high. Okay, we're down to 1,100 feet per second, so we're getting into the ballpark, but those bullet holes are not looking good, man. Not looking good at all. Here's 11.0. Well, that's good news. We're, we're getting pretty close to the correct velocity, like that last one was 1057, and the bullet holes look better right now than they have with any of the previous loads. Okay, last up, 10.5 grains. Nah, that one looks a little bit sideways. Okay, well, crapola. Not a good start here, folks. Let's get back to the bench. We'll chart out these velocities. We'll inspect the bullet holes. We'll see what we can, uh, see where we can go from here. Damn it, folks. <sighs> This was supposed to be a mental health rejuvenation video. I did not see this coming. This is bad. Like this is really, really bad. Let me see if I can get my camera adjusted so we can have a look. There we go. This is not good, man. The bullets are going through a little bit sideways. Listen, some of these really uh, goofy bullets, like this bullet, you know, extremely blunt, goofy ogive, something like the Maker Rex, I think it was a 200 grain Maker Rex, the Lehigh Defense subsonic bullet. Like some of these bullets, even when you get them shooting well, you get a little bit of an extra smear on your bullet hole. Like they're, they're kind of, they're flying well, but there's still a little bit of instability. But this is too much. Like this is really bad. Like th these are some of the better ones. 
There you go. So there's some that are worse. Look at that. I don't want to send that through my suppressor. These are baffle strikes waiting to happen. This was the very best one. This is absolutely the best one. Still not good enough. Just not good enough at all. And the really bad ones are really, really bad. Yeah, there's that guy. That's just bad, man. Now, as poorly as they flew, the velocity was extremely stable. Let's have a look at this chart. Very predictable velocities. And it looks like 10.9 grains will give us just about, just a little bit under 1,050 feet per second. So I tell you what, for the rest of this video, that's what we're gonna shoot, 10.9 grains of CFE black, and hopefully that'll keep us in that 1,050 or just under it sort of range. So where do we go from here? Well, the only thing we've got left to test is overall length. I wanna shoot some different overall lengths and see if maybe changing that up will help a little bit. Now, you might be saying to yourself, man, try a different powder. Well, I don't wanna try a different powder because We've shot enough freaking videos on this channel with 300 blackout that any bullet, any bullet, I don't care what freaking bullet it is, if it can't stabilize all the way from 850 feet per second up to 1200 feet per second, and with any powder between like accurate number nine on the extremely fast burning side all the way down to Reloader 7 or IMR 4198 on the slow burning side, it should be able to stabilize with any of that crap. Any velocity within our range and any burn speed within our powder choices. If it's not able to do that, it's just not a bullet I'm interested in. Like let's say we pulled out a faster burning powder, maybe Lil Gun or Winchester 296, and the bullet stabilized, well, I'm still not gonna be completely confident in it. I'm not gonna be confident enough to hit the woods with it and hunt with it. That's just kinda how I feel. So here we are. We'll try some different overall lengths here with CFE Black, and if it doesn't stabilize within, well, you know, they can't all be winners. Okay, so in that last loading, we shot a, an overall length of about 2.075, which was a cartridge-based ogive measurement of about 1.685. Let's go a little bit shorter than that. Let's shoot a cartridge-based ogive number of 1.660, which, what will that be? Yeah, so that'll be 2.050 inches of overall length. And let's go longer from there in 10 thousandths increments all the way up to 2.090, which should only be about 5 thousandths off the lands. So that's the plan. Those are the next five tests. We'll load up two of each and just kind of see what happens. I'm not getting my hopes up. I think we probably got a dud here. It's just this bullet and my barrel don't seem to be playing very well together. And as I was preparing for this video, believe it or not, I do prepare a little bit for these videos. I did see quite a few reviews, like on Midway, if you go to the customer reviews and some other places, I did see some people talking about this bullet just not stabilizing in their gun, but I saw a whole lot of people saying that it shot really well for them. So regardless of my outcome, it might still be worth trying this bullet in your gun, but you know, it's not looking good here for my barrel, but we're gonna keep trying. Let's load up 10 more. I need some more powder charges, and then we'll seat some more bullets and get back out there. All right, so assuming this doesn't work out, which I'm not holding my breath here. I'm keeping the hope, right? Like I'm, uh, I'm gonna hope that things go well, but if they don't, like I mentioned earlier, I've got a whole bunch of factory ammo. That's what we'll turn this video into. We'll turn this video into a factory ammo test because I've already shot some of those guys and I know that some of them are shooting pretty well. So maybe we can salvage something. Now the first one here, 1.660, that is our shortest overall length. I kind of got lucky here. I was gonna back out the seating die and kind of start over, but decided to just seat the first couple here and see what happened. And it just so happens that it's perfect. Now 10.5 grains, or I'm sorry, 10.9 grains, which is our final charge weight here for this video, is toward the lower end of what we were shooting earlier. Yep, 1.660, maybe just a touch short. Now these are not compressed, or if they are, they're just very, very lightly compressed. So that's good news. So I should be able to take my seating die and go out 10 thousandths. All right, let's see what that gives us. Should be pretty close. Our next um, target is 1.670. And I'm just a touch short at 1.668. 
but that's fine. I've already uh, seeded one of them, so we'll go ahead and stick with this number for the second one. But this next one, I'll go out 12 thousandths. So there is 5, 10, 11, 12. Okay, this should be 1.680. And let's see what this gives us. I'm still just a touch short. 1.677. All right, there we go. That should be way long. Our next target is 1.690. See what this guy gives us. Should be long. Should be extremely long. Yeah, I'm not sure if I forgot how to count somewhere along the way, but now we're just about perfect. So 1.690, and here's the second one. Should be right about the same. Yep, right on the money, 1.690. So let me go out 10,000 more, and I'll go a couple extra just for the heck of it, and see what this gets us. 1.7 is our last target. Yeah, so I'm lucky I went out a little bit, 1.6995. Good, so... These look good. Let's hit the range. Okay, so we'll start with our shortest overall length and we'll move longer. So first up is 2.050. Let's see what happens. I've got the same target at 100 yards. I just put some pasties over the bullet holes. So yeah, everything's the same. Wow, that actually looks like a good bullet hole. Yeah, they look a little bit wonky, but not terrible. So moving on, next up, 2.060. Yeah, those look kind of screwed up. Not great. Third is uh, 2.070. Yeah, both of those look pretty gnarly, but at 2.070, we're very close to the 2.075 that we shot last time. So 2.080, we're a little bit closer to the lands. See what happens. Okay, nothing great. The second one didn't look too bad, but the first one was pretty bad. Last up, 2.090. This is only about five thousandths off the lands. Let's see what happens. Yeah, those look a little bit wonky. So our best looking bullet holes were with the shortest ones, the 2.050 inch overall length. Let's see what our velocities looked like. Yeah, all of those were within uh, 1,024 feet per second up to 1,057 feet per second. So very excellent velocities, but that does us no good if they're not flying stable. All right, there we go. Now we got our Silencer Co. Omega Suppressor on there, and I've got six different types of factory ammo out here that I want to try out. All of these I've shot at least a couple times to check stability. So we're going to shoot five shot groups with each of them. Now, all of these are very different from today's bullet. These are all open tip match type bullets. I've always found that the 220 grain Sierra Match King has been my best performing bullet for 300 blackout subsonics. And these are all very similar to that. The first one here is PNW Arms Defensive 300 Blackout Subsonic. I don't know, man. It's a 220 grain hollow point bow tail. I can tell you from my earlier testing, these shot probably the best. So I'm hoping for a good group here with the PNW Arms. Let's see what happens. All right, so I was hoping for a little bit better group than that, but the velocity was right on the number, 1,067 feet per second. You can't ask for much better than that, and none of them went supersonic. Like, I, I should be able to tell by ear if any of them go super, and none of those went super. And next up is American Eagle. This little crap. The, this is the worst thing ever, because they, they put them in a box that is not reclosable. Yeah, American Eagle Suppressor. 220 grain OTM subsonic. Just the worst packaging ever. A non-reclosable box. Who in the hell thought that was a good idea? But let's see if they'll shoot. All 
All right, so I hate that box. I'm, I'm always dumping crap everywhere. I'm constantly picking up freaking rounds, but it shoots pretty well, which I guess your average shooter would open up a box of 20, load it into a 20 or 30 round magazine and get rid of them. But me, I've got like 10 or 12 left and it's a pain in the ass, man. That box sucks. Maybe they've updated that by now. Like I mentioned, this crap's all pretty old. It's a couple years old. I bought it for some previous video that never got made. So next is some Remington like white box, I guess you'd call this. 220 grain, open tip flat base is the label on it. Let's see if it'll shoot. Ah, so that third shot kind of flew way low. That's weird. Huh, crap. That one had promise, but a couple shots screwed it all up. Okay, so this last one was the Remington white box, and this one I guess would be called the Remington green box. I don't know what the difference is. They're both 220 grain open tip match subsonics. So we'll see what the hell the difference is. Hopefully this one will shoot a better group. Okay, that stuff didn't lock the bolt back. Okay, so the next ammo is Sig Sauer Elite Performance. And like all of the others, it is a 220 grain open tip match bullet. You know what I might do is go inside and see if I can find any loaded ammunition I've got with the 200 grain Maker Rex bullet. That might be worth a test. But here, this is the Sig. Let's see if it'll shoot. All right, so the Sig Sauer Elite Performance wasn't too bad. That's probably our best group so far. What is that, about a, eh, probably a 1.3, 1.4 inch group. Nothing great, but then again, nothing terrible. All of these have kind of shot okay. Our last factory ammo to test here is this Nozzler Match Grade, 220 grain custom competition. Let's see if these dudes will shoot. All right, so that didn't quite lock the bolt back. No big deal, right? Just a little bit of a gas adjustment. And yeah, this nozzler and I think one of the others didn't lock the bolt back, but that's no big deal. So we've got solidly mediocre performance out of our factory ammo, right? All of them had great velocities, right? Our lowest velocity was 1,027 feet per second and our highest was 1,067 feet per second. That's right in the perfect zone. Like today happens to be a uh, a day, it's about 85 degrees, so a pretty warm day here in Kentucky, and the numbers were just perfect. So one more group I wanna shoot. I wanna go inside and I wanna see if I've got any of the 220 grain or 200 grain, yeah, it's a 200 grain Maker Rex bullet, my hunting loads. I've killed a deer with that load. So let me go inside and see if I can find it. We'll come out, we'll shoot a group with that and see how it does. Okay, so I found a batch of the 200 grain Maker Rex bullets. I'm pretty sure this is the exact same batch that I used to kill a deer here in Kentucky a couple years ago. It is 9.8 grains of accurate 1680, but these were loaded for my 16 inch barrel. I expect them to be a little bit low on velocity here out of this 10.3 inch. Let's see if they'll hold a group. So I've run out of fresh dots down there. So let's, uh, let's use the top right dot and I'll use the video to track which hits or which, I guess. I don't know, let's see what happens. Yeah, didn't quite cycle, no big surprise. 
low velocity and won't, won't quite cycle the gun. These were loaded for the 16 incher. Okay, not a great group there. Kinda ugly to be honest with you. Now the same box has got some of the Barnes Tac TX bullets here. For some reason I didn't write down on the box what they are. So I'm not 100% certain whether they're the 110s or the 120s. I think they're 110s. I don't know. We're putting a lot of faith in the me from the past who loaded these. I don't know, what the hell. Let's see what happens. These are gonna be supersonic and they're gonna hit quite a bit high, I think. So let's shoot at one of the lower dots. Okay, so I had my chronograph settings completely wrong for that. So I didn't get accurate velocity information for those, but that's okay. Let's get back to the bench and try and make sense of all this crazy crap that happened today. All right, folks, so it is a week later and I'm sitting down to edit this video and I'm screaming at myself. Like the shorter overall lengths seem to be getting better with our Nosler Ballistic Tip Subsonic. So why did I give up? Why didn't I keep going shorter? and seeing if that helped things. The video is already 45 minutes long. Let's just keep going. Let's do one more range trip. Let's load these guys shorter. Now our last test, we tested overall lengths from 2.090 down to 2.050. So let's jump 50 thousandths more. Let's go down to 2.000. I wanna load up 10 of them. A couple of them I wanna shoot into ballistic gel because even if we don't have these guys stabilizing perfectly, I would really like to see what their, you know, their gel performance, their terminal performance, whatever. I wanna see what it looks like. So these will be 50 thousandths shorter than anything else we've shot in this video. Now, because we're shortening the overall length, I wanna go ahead and drop the charge weight by one tenth of a grain of our Hodgson CFE Black. So this loading will be 10.8 grains. I'm not gonna do a very good job of showing it in this video, but back when we were shooting our last 10 rounds, you could see that the velocity was dropping as our overall length got longer. So I'm afraid that if we shorten up the overall length like we're about to do, the, the velocity is gonna jump up high enough to where we, we start having some supers. So I wanna make sure all of these are subsonic. So let's go to 10.8 grains. That's really it. The bullet seating die is still set in the press. Everything's ready to go. I just need to weigh out 10 charge weights and seat the bullets. We've seen enough of that crap. So let's just go ahead and get back out on the range. All right, folks, we got a little bit of a problem here. Have a look at these first three that I'm trying to seat this short. That is not good. It's not good at all. These are completely ruined. I need to pull them out and throw them in the trash. So here's what I want to do. Like, I think we have no other option than to switch powders if we want to shoot a short overall length. And the natural choice is my favorite 300 blackout powder, Winchester 296. This stuff's excellent for, you know, good high velocities with supersonic loads, but it's also really good for subsonics as long as you've got a pistol length gas system. So Winchester 296, we're going to try a couple loads with Winchester 296 and the 220 grain Nosler ballistic tip subsonic. Now, the reason this helps is that Winchester 296 requires a much smaller charge weight than CFE Black. So what we're gonna shoot is 9.0 grains of Winchester 296. I've looked back through my notes of other 296, Winchester 296 loads in this barrel. I think we're gonna be subsonic. We should be. Nine grains should be just about right. So what I need to do is dump out these charges of CFE Black that I've already weighed out and switch things up and go with nine grains of, of uh, 296. So that's the plan. Now, if I have this sort of problem with Winchester 296, which I really don't think we will, you know, we're gonna be a smaller charge weight. We're not gonna be as compressed. This is all about the charge just getting too compressed, too much pressure on that bullet trying to seat it. So I think with Winchester 296 down at 9.0 grains of powder, we're gonna have more room to seat the bullet before we're compressed. If not, I'll let you know. 
If everything goes smoothly, I'll see you guys out on the range. Okay, let's start out with the gel test. And as you can see, this gel is in pretty bad shape. Got a big old chunk missing here from the back, but I'm hoping it's gonna be good enough to stop a subsonic. So let's shoot a couple at it and see if we can stop one. The distance is gonna be like 15 feet, something like that. Hmm, okay. I can't even tell if I hit it. The gel didn't move a whole lot. Let's try another one. Okay, here's the third one. All right, so on that third one, I heard something bouncing through the trees, so I'm assuming that we probably missed the gel. Let me look for the first two, see if they're in here somewhere. All right, so I definitely found at least one of them, but I wanna shoot two more through it just to be sure. I think there might be at least one more hidden in the gel here somewhere, but I wanna shoot two more. I'm gonna to try to aim a little bit lower. I got a feeling I was going a little bit high the last time. All right, so the first one, I heard it bouncing around in the woods, but the second one, I didn't hear anything. So I wanna look through this gel, see what I can find, and we'll have a look once we get back to the bench. But for the time being, let's go ahead and shoot a couple groups. Okay, so I recovered at least two of the bullets out of the uh, ballistic gel. So we'll be able to have a look at those here in just a few minutes. Back at the bench. Now I wanna shoot a group with this 9.0 grains of Winchester 296 and see what our velocity is. And I've got the freaking suppressor on there to hell with it. I'm just gonna leave it on there. And if we get a baffle strike, then whatever. Let's see if these guys are grouped. Nine grains of Winchester 296 and an overall length of two inches. We'll see what happens. Okay, that shot went way high into the left. We didn't read a velocity. What the hell's going on here? I forgot to arm it. Crap. All right, now the chronograph is armed. We didn't feed properly. Yep, much faster burning powder, so we didn't even eject the spent cartridge. I'm not gonna worry about adjusting my uh, gas block for this couple of shots, so whatever. I'm gonna change the dot I'm shooting at. I was currently shooting at the top left dot, and the shot went almost off the paper, so I'm gonna move dots. Hopefully we can get a group here. Okay, that wasn't too bad. And velocity was 1,034 feet per second. That's pretty close. Yeah, those bullet holes are still not looking very good. That flew almost completely sideways and hit way up and to the left. All right, there's our last shot. The velocities were actually pretty good. So here's where I'm left. These guys with Winchester 296 are still not flying straight. We got a couple of them shot into ballistic gel that we need to, to look at. But I started this video with 50 pieces of brand new Hornady brass. And I wanna go ahead and shoot them to get them all fire formed. So what I did was I loaded up 20 rounds with the 220 grain Sierra Match King. This has traditionally been my best performing bullet in 300 blackout subsonics. I loaded them up with this exact same load, 9.0 grains of Winchester 296. So let, let's load up some of these guys. I've got 20 of them. We might just shoot a 20 shot group here and see how they do. All right, folks, I think we're finally done. Let's get back to the bench. All right, so here are the bullets and a couple of tips that I've uh, recovered from the ballistic gel. This performance is extremely disappointing. A Little bit of expansion there, but overall, most of the bullet, it just didn't expand. Here's the other one, similar sort of deal. Not even close to what we've seen with copper solids. The Lehigh Defense, 
the Maker Rex. Those guys open up like crazy. I thought I had one still laying around here, but I, I misplaced it. I'll try and put up a picture of what the, the Maker Rex looks like when it expands. Huge expansion. These guys, this is just, this is lame. Extremely disappointing. I expected much better. Yeah, this is just, you know, maybe it's a little bit better than an open tip match, you know, match bullet, but it's nowhere close to the copper solid performance. So I really can't say that I'm impressed with these bullets at all. I'll be interested to hear your experience down in the comments. Like if these guys shoot well for you, let me know. I feel like I gave them every opportunity to, to succeed here. We tried a, different, a couple different powders. We tried a million different overall lengths and they just, they weren't flying stable. And to make matters worse, the performance in ballistic gel was just not awesome. So this video has been an epic failure. It's time to put it out of its misery. I have no idea how the hell I stretched this into an hour long video. This should have been a 10 minute video. Hi, how you doing? These bullets suck. See you next time. Like that should have basically been the crux of the video, but man, I really stretched this one out and I apologize for that. <laughs> so that's where we leave it. I think I'm to the point where I need to understand that my, my 300 blackout setup right now just doesn't shoot that well. I think our best group today out of everything was about an inch and a half. You know, it, it's like a two inch upper and it really makes me miss my old 16 inch upper. The old 16 inch upper had a $79 AR stoner barrel in it. I mean, it was, it was the cheapest barrel you can find. Plus it was a mid-length gas system, so we were always fighting function problems with it. But it shot so well, man. We shot so many good groups with that barrel. And this 10.3 inch uh, ballistic advantage just isn't quite as accurate. And even back then, our 8.5 inch Rainier Ultra Match barrel wasn't as accurate as the 16 incher. So I like shooting small groups. I'm not sure where to go from here. I might need to tweak this upper a little bit, see if I can squeeze some more accuracy out of it. I don't know. The good news though, is that now we've got a 300 blackout upper that's put together and we can continue to do some videos every once in a while. As I mentioned, it had been a year and a half since our last 300 blackout video. I enjoy 300 blackout. I like shooting subsonics with a suppressor. It's a lot of fun. So I don't know, I don't really have any plans for our next 300 blackout video, but I know that it's not going to be a year and a half. I promise you that. So I think that's where we'll leave this folks. Thanks for sticking with it. It's been a long and disappointing video, but it is what it is. All right, folks, I'll see you guys next time.